Welcome to the SRS Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron J. Babiar, and I'm the Training Director of Support Raising Solutions. Whether you're a new ministry worker or a veteran looking to increase your competence and confidence, Support Raising Solutions seeks to bless you in your quest to be a spiritually healthy, vision-driven, fully funded Great Commission worker. Our guests once again today are Erica Fouché and Danielle Sparks with Every Nation's Ministries. Uh, Welcome back, both of you. So glad you could join us for part two of our three-part podcast here on race and support raising. Of course, we talk about a lot of other things too, but uh, I think it's very timely for us to be doing this recording and, and publishing this for people to hear. So, wow, part one was fantastic. So I'm already very excited for us to record uh, part two today. So welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. We're very glad to be with you. Well, Danielle, we had Erica tell us a little bit about herself last time. Some people might not know you as well. So, uh, of course, uh, you and I have been able to hang out several different states, several different places, several different times. And and uh, we I just always love hanging out with you. But I know there's a there's a family behind the man here. So tell us a little bit more about you and about your family before we we jump into the topic today, please. Absolutely. I am, of course, married to my lovely bride, Lanair. Uh, we celebrate our 26th wedding anniversary in just about two months. Um, we have four wonderful adult children. Uh, they're all mm-hmm. spread throughout the country in college, uh, living the dream, I would say. Now, they're, because it's a COVID season, uh, most mm-hmm. of them are home. But uh, right. they, are, they are great young men and women, and it's been a divine opportunity to sit and minister to them throughout this season. Um, Mm. But I've been in ministry about as long as I've been married, and I love both. And uh, God's been very good to me and my family. Very cool. Very cool. And so you guys met, I think, in California. And you you, have you raised your family mostly in Tennessee? Uh, uh, Half and half. All my children were born either in California or Nevada. And then we moved to Tennessee about 15 years ago when I became the uh, NPD director. And so uh, uh, it's been a wonderful move. We've enjoyed Tennessee tremendously. And the funny thing is, I protested. I wasn't going to move to Tennessee. I was going to stay in California and be a pastor. Um, <laughs> but I had a divine appointment in Tennessee on my scouting trip. Mm-hmm. And I met missionary after missionary who pleaded with, uh, with me to move. And finally, the Holy Spirit got a hold of my heart. And I joined the, the ministry here. And, and I haven't regretted a day of it. It's been fantastic. Awesome. Very cool. Very cool. Well, as we continue our conversation here in the the, the second part of the second episode, uh, I know that we wanted to we wanted to kind of help listeners uh, align and grab hold with God's kingdom perspectives on, on this whole topic and explore uh, His unchanging nature and His Word and biblical examples and perspectives and responses and all that in in, in this in this conversation. And so, you know, with, with that being said, you know, in our last conversation, we discussed uh, things in the rope of partnership, uh, and we even talked about things that need to need to be let go of. So let's start right there. And uh, I'll kick it to either one of you. Kind kind of tell us a little bit more about that whole idea of, you know, we're we're, we're working with a rope analogy here. There's there's getting a grip, there's knots, there's tensions, there's holding on, there's letting go. Like where where are we at in that conversation? Sure. I think right now we are in the context of getting a grip. And, and I think as Christians, this is probably one of the hardest parts of following God. When we spoke earlier about knots and tensions, of course, uh, there's always knots and tensions. Uh, but there's also a point where you say, look, enough is enough. I'm going to tie a knot or I'm going to get a grip right here. And what, what I think I mean by getting a grip is really getting a grip on God's perspective. I think as Christians, one of the hardest things to do is to let go of the way we see things and to hold on to the way God sees things, to let go of of what our word says and hold on to what God's word says. It's a lifestyle. It's a practice. It's not easy. But that's what I mean when I say get a grip. Mm. Uh, the, The reality of what we're called to hold on to has more to do with God's will for us than our will for ourselves. And that is 
sometimes a hard pill to swallow. Mm. Uh, and we see that struggle throughout scripture where there's individuals who want to respond one way, want to do something, and God changes their way. Maybe he doesn't change their mind, but he changes their way. Mm. And that's a that's a difficult process to go through. And I think that's where we are now. There's We're in a season where we, there's a lot of, of political responses. There's plenty of social responses. There are ethnic responses. There are community responses. But God's called us to have a biblical response, mm. a godly response. And, and I think right now we're wrestling with how to actually respond the right way to the circumstances, to the circumstances God has appointed us to. Right, right. Now, Erica, some of the, the uh, you know, we're talking about race and support raising. And, and I know some people might think, oh, those two don't have anything to do with each other. Well, no, they, they really do. <laughs> they really like it. Those uh, those conversations sometimes do come together. Uh, and, and that's true, uh, whether you know, you're African-American like yourselves or Caucasian like I am. But um, even I mean, even globally, that can be an issue. And, and by way of example, I have heard and I want to I want to believe the best. And, 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 and say that I believe these people were, tra- were, were intending to be well-intentioned. But I have heard some lies come out of people's mouths um, where they will say something like, well, that person could, could never raise support. They're an ethnic minority. Like that's wrong for us to even assume that they could. Uh, and I, I've heard people say stuff like that and really had to like bite my tongue and calm down a little bit. Uh, and, th- and then I've heard the other side too, where people have said, well, you can't ask somebody who's an ethnic minority for support that that's demanding more out of that community than they, they haven't they been through enough. Like I, I've heard, again, I want, I want to believe the best about the people that were saying these things, but also it really kind of fired me up a little bit because I disagreed. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, Erica, as, as, as you hear these these type of ideas, how do we how do we like lovingly, peacefully, forcefully, however you want to put it, how, how do we combat these ideas? Yeah. And truth be told, I had those same sorts of ideas, mentalities, lies swirling around in my own heart as I was developing my initial team. It, I wouldn't have said those words or been as explicit as you just said, but I'd look at somebody to the left or to the right of me and say, well, they can do it because of X, Y, Z, and I'll have a harder time or can't do it because of A, B, C. And mm-hmm. the reality is I had to question, and I often ask questions of people, well, where did that come from? Who mm-hmm. told you that? I mean, it's almost like when Jesus is asking the disciples the question, who do you say I am? And he's talking about how, you know, this person says this, this person says this, but what do you say? And ultimately it has to come down to that. So I like to ask people questions of where did that come from? What shaped that thought in you? And ultimately, what does God have to say about that? Mm -hmm. Uh, The scripture that comes to mind is that all the promises of God are, are yes in him, in Christ. And that's where they, they find their amen through us. And so are we giving our amen to what God says, or are we giving our amen to something else, our experience, uh, our perceived uh, abilities or resources and and that sort of thing? So uh, when people ask those sorts of questions, I also try to bring them to a bigger perspective of what God has called you to, what God has maybe called that ethnic minority that you're debating, should I ask them or should I not? Mm -hmm. I just remember going to a partnership appointment and thinking of the people who were there. And at the time I was living in Los Angeles and I I was living near UCLA, which is a pretty affluent part of town. And some of the people who were in this meeting were from third world countries Mm. and just made it to the States. And so I had a perception about what their resources were. Mm -hmm. And as I was driving home from that partnership appointment or from the the group meeting, God said to me, who are you to say who can participate in the gospel? Mm -hmm. And the gospel is not just for the rich, it's for everybody. So Mm -hmm. God is reconciling people to himself. And it's not even a racial reconciliation that he's after. Racial reconciliation is not uh, the reconciliation or solely the reconciliation that we're talking about biblically. But how do we 
help people to come into alignment with what God is saying and, and reconcile to his purposes in the earth that he is ultimately wanting to use all humanity, specifically yeah. the body of Christ to fulfill. Yeah. Well, that's a great example. That's such a wonderful example because uh, I think in reality, people might start from a place. This is where I, I was talking about like trying to believe the best. Like I'm yeah. sure Erica, in your heart, you're thinking, Hey, I can't ask these people for something. They don't, they don't have much of anything. Like they, they just got to the U S they're from a third world country. They're probably struggling to get by. Like that would be so rude of me to ask them for something, but that's, that's through a pretty narrow lens. Uh, and, and it sounds as if the Holy spirit kind of, kind of spoke to you and said, no, wait a minute here. You, you don't get to pick. <laughs> I, I got this. And even to go one step further, and I don't, I'm certainly not the Holy spirit and don't even want to try and be, but I, I think sometimes we can be guilty of trying to play the Holy Spirit. And sometimes we unintentionally, because again, I want to believe the best about people. We can unintentionally rob people from being part of Great Commission things because somehow, you know, they don't drive a nice enough car. They don't live in a big enough house or they don't have an affluent enough job. So, uh, you know, somehow the scripture must say that they don't get to be a part, right? Well, no, <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Um, what they can give and how much they can give and when they can give, or even in some places in the world, what they can give. Okay. That might be different, but yeah. they don't, they're not disqualified. Nobody is disqualified as, as, uh, as, as being a part of what God is doing. His, his right. kingdom is coming. We're, we're right. just a part. Right. You know, and one of the one of the as I talk with other organizations, and and they all have the heart to see their people of color fully funded. Mm -hmm. I've actually come across uh, organizations with very good intentions that encourage their people of color to go to and stick with people of color when it came to inviting them to be a part of the Great Commission, mm. and. It, and I said, I know where you're coming from. You're coming from a place of comfort, one. You want them comfortable in the process. But then two, you might not know how to challenge them to go to others. And I said, let me, let me just encourage you in this reality is that in order to be successful in partnership development, we all need to engage more than just our surrounding community. Uh, because we serve a multifaceted God, it's, 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 and I've said this before, it's indicative of his character to provide opportunities to build a multi-ethnic or multicultural team. And I found that if I would have limited, and Erica mentioned this as well, my partnership efforts to my friends and family that were just like me, and Aaron, you said this, I would have missed huge opportunity to invite and involve others in the Great Commission that were just as called, but weren't colored like me. Hmm. And I am so grateful that in many ways, by desperation, as I engaged people that weren't like me, I found many in many ways they were just as willing and sometimes even more willing because I was different from them to mm -hmm. join my team because they, they didn't just see a Great Commission that they were a part of, but they were. There was a second prayer being answered. Lord, bring a friend that I am not like. Expand who I am. Expand the tent pegs of what I I'm like. Bring people around me that aren't like me. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. even through partnership now, I have friends from multiple other countries, multiple other ethnicities that had I not engaged them with the opportunity to be a part of the Great Commission, we wouldn't be friends today and we wouldn't have the perspectives that we have. And yeah. now I want to echo what Eris, Erica said. You know, I think that uh, God's not a, re a respecter of persons, but we are. You know, the opportunities that God has laid out are not gerrymandered. They're not for this group of people or for that group of people. Um, but the, the marks or the, the marks of faith are, are really under our feet, under the opportunities we actually take. And it's better not to play God in this process. We're tempted to. We're tempted to play God by saying, OK, Lord, surely these are the people you've called to join my team. Mm. Uh, but really, when we predetermine where our team comes from, we limit where our team can come from. Yeah. So I've stopped limiting God by limiting who can be a part of my team. Amen. Amen. Now, of course, uh, this context of, of our conversation is largely uh, U.S. based. But again, this does have global 
implications. Um, I have a friend and I really can't say a whole lot about her outside of that because she lives in a, in a closed country. And uh, by closed country, I mean, it's, it's illegal for her to be a follower of Christ. It's illegal for her family to share the love of God with others. Um, but she has completely raised, uh, she and her husband, they have raised a, a full support team uh, and they are doing missions uh, to unreached people groups. They're, they're incredible people, um, but, but they're, they're from uh, that, that closed country. So they have the ability to go reach these peoples that, that uh, I know I would, uh, I mean, in this lifetime, I seriously doubt I'll be able to travel to that region of the world. I, my life would be, uh, I mean, I'd be, I'd be asking to be killed, let's be honest, but wow. moving, moving away from that. So this lady and her husband are able to do that. And uh, through an interpreter, uh, we, we've been able to hang out a few times over the years when I've been on the other side of the world. And it was so interesting. We, we started talking about um, even the their, their, their money, like how they do finances. It's very different. No, nothing's based on the U S dollar. I'll tell you that. And, um, as I started saying, so, you know, as you invite people to your team, you know, what does that look like? How, how are you, how is your support, uh, you, not just your prayer support, but your actual like material support, how is that provided for? And, uh, she went into, it's a longer story, but the short version is she has some people on her team that and they are a part of her team and they are not by any stretch of the imagination affluent um mm. but they pray for her regularly she checks in with them when she has the opportunity when she travels through the countryside in which they live uh and once a month and i'm not even making this up they give her a chicken and some eggs every month Wonderful. and they use that as a part of their support so that they can go to unreached people groups and spread the love of Jesus. So it's this incredible thing. But if, if this lady would have said, no, I just need access to this type of money in this way, using this banking system through this country, she would have, and if, if she would have lacked the ability to think out of just the community in which she was born and, and that, and that alone, she would have totally missed out on some partnership in the gospel that, that went beyond the, the natural family of origin or, or, the, or the other, the other boundaries that just kind of, kind of set up in life. So um, I really appreciate your, your perspective on that, on that, even from, from a U.S. context, because I can, I can tell Danielle, God has really blessed you with, uh, with some team members that they weren't, they weren't from the neighborhood that, that you came from, right? They definitely are not. <laughs> if you love to read, we have an entire blog article archive on support raising. From biblical encouragement to practical tips to stories and personal experiences. Meanwhile, there's different articles that are more along the lines of shaping culture, elevating training, and building infrastructure so that you can multiply your coaching within your missions organization. Either way, you might want to go check out some of our articles at supportraisingsolutions.org slash blog. So, uh, Erica, I know that, you know, as we, you know, we're talking a little about scriptures with all of this, you know, Nehemiah, Nehemiah just seems to come up in this support raising conversation. It always does because there's so much going on there. But tell, tell us more uh, about the, the particular passage in Nehemiah 1, 4 through 9 and kind of how that relates to this conversation about getting a grip. Yeah, um, we, Danelle and I, have been just rehashing Nehemiah over and over and looking at it from multiple angles. But in looking at it in the, in the context of race, the reality is Nehemiah was living in captivity. It's not his choice that he was there. He had limited resources of people who were around him to uh, support him in what he wanted and those people weren't from his culture. And so when he got word of what was happening in uh, Jerusalem, he, he wept and cried, and you see this acknowledgement of care and love for his people. You see this acknowledgement of his own emotions and what's going on with that, but he brings that to the Lord. And as he does, uh, he gets God's perspective. But part of that perspective that he got, it's interesting, he, he had a word from the Lord. He was almost like reminding God of his promises of mm. what he had, what God had in store for him. For Israel. So his eyes were brought into the people of Israel's greater purpose in God's plan. And uh, he was able to embrace that perspective. He was able to take the word, fight with it against the circumstance. And then he, he ultimately asked for favor with the king. 
And so for us, what stood out again was getting a grip of God's word. What has God said and how are you giving your amen to that despite your feelings about what's happening, despite uh, your experience of uh, what's happened in your life, uh, through your life, God is wanting to give us his perspective and that came from his word. It came from prayer to God, involving God in the process and allowing God to change his heart. So, so those are some of the things that we're seeing uh, Nehemiah got a grip of that we encourage our missionaries to. But again, his vision was open to a bigger perspective of what God had actually called him to do beyond what was Nehemiah's own will or allegiance to his race, but it was more aligned with God's purposes and, and stepping into those things. Mm. Mm. Good stuff. Great stuff. So, um, you know, just kind of stick with this scriptural theme here. Uh, you know, we've touched on second Corinthians and, and, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, we did second Nehemiah just now, but then second Corinthians was mentioned before. Um, you know, the, the Ephesians two, talks about, for we are his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And Danielle, I want to go back to you with that. How How has it, give us another, if, if, if you don't mind, Dick, another just like real life example of how that has played out. Uh, and maybe with a little bit more specificity, you can leave out names if you want to, but sure. tell, tell, how, how has that played out? Put some, put some flesh on the bones as that relates to uh, race in America and raising sure. support and some of the things that you've experienced. Sure. Uh, you know, when it talks about we were created for good works, and, and I always I haven't told my whole story, but I, I, I come from what many describe as a violent past. My first response wasn't always positive <laughs> or friendly. And uh, uh, God had to work with quite a few things out of my life before I entered into ministry. And even while I was in ministry, I was still challenged uh, on a number of different areas regarding uh, how I responded. And I still am. But I had a particular circumstance where uh, God led me to engage in a relationship with, uh, with a Caucasian couple uh, that were very well off at the time. We did not know each other very well, but even though we met each other for the very first time, they began to communicate to me some things that were very contrary to my view of history, even to the point of justifying uh, and, and eloquently justifying uh, in past injustices hmm. in, this, in this context. Well, God, it, it was God's will because look, he used it. And, and of course we, you know, I shared my ministry with them. Obviously, in their eyes, I was a black guy. And so, uh, you know, they wanted some agreement from me. And I said, I can't give it to you. Hmm. And as we sat and talked further. I said, you know what, let me, let me, do you mind if I share with you my perspective and my historical understanding of race in America, slavery, and what Africa could look like or could have looked like had the gospel been deposited there? versus people from Africa being deposited elsewhere. Hmm. And they, because of the way we had our, we, we engaged in our previous conversation, they actually sat and listened and uh, didn't understand uh, the perspective I was sharing for a while until we finally came to some conclusions regarding biblically what Christ would have wanted. Uh, even though God uses circumstances in our life to change us and turns all things around, for his glory, it doesn't mean that what was done to get there was righteous. And as we talked further, um, um, not only did they continue their partnership, they repented. Um, we, we, have a, we have a great relationship to this day, and their children now have also joined uh, my partnership team. Wow. And they have lives of their own. But had it not been for the process of reaching across what at that time was a border to me or a barrier to me. Yeah. If it wasn't for the sake of pressing in on the engagement and really seeing the divine appointment. And I, I totally give God the credit on this because I wasn't thinking this way in the moment. It was hindsight that was telling me, you know what? Yeah. You, you know what? You, you're led by the spirit in the moment. However, uh, I've now made that part of my practice is to really hear people out, especially when we're talking about things of, of great tension 
yeah. especially when I'm talking to partners, because who knows what the Holy Spirit is doing in their life and bringing them to an understanding that God has more for them in the way they're living their life than uh, mm. what they're doing now. And I want to wrap it up by saying this. Though God has called us to the ministry of reconciliation, that reconciliation needs to be reflected also by living reconciled lives. And the question is that I, that I was asking then was, in light of all that you shared with me, are you really living a reconciled life? If you're talking about this being good for America or good for black people, hmm. show me in your life where you do have that, that ministry of reconciliation active in other, in other ethnic groups and other ethnic relationships. And they couldn't. And so right. uh, it was, you know, we had a great conversation about it. Of course, I, I wasn't sharing names or anything like that, but they're good friends to this day yeah. because somebody was able to sit down with them and say, I disagree. This is what the Bible says. This is how you apply it. And this is what it will look like if you truly want to live reconciled. Wow. That's a, that's such a great way to end this episode that we're calling get a grip because in a lot of ways you were lovingly telling them to get a grip. So, yeah. uh, man, that's, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Well, uh, of course we're going to do this one more time, but I, I think that's, uh, that's a, a lot for people to chew on for this week. So, Erica Pouchet, Danielle Sparks, thank you for joining us again on the SRS podcast. I, I hope you'll plan to join us one more time for next week. <laughs> that would be our Thanks pleasure. For having us. Okay. All right. So we'll go ahead and close it for today, and we'll see everybody back here next week on the SRS podcast. God bless. Thanks for joining us for this episode. We would love to hear your ideas for future content. Please visit supportraisingsolutions.org slash feedback to share your thoughts and questions. Also, wherever you download your podcast from, be sure to subscribe for future episodes and come back each week to gain more insight into the process of building and maintaining your personal support team.